Welcome everybody. This is Knit 56. It's my fourth episode. It's August 17th, 2016, and I can't believe I'm up to episode four already. I didn't know if I'd make it through one. <laughs> but I have some really fun things to talk about today that I'm really excited about. And I would first like to say thank you to everyone who's responded and subscribed to my YouTube channel, Knit 56, and joined my group on Ravelry called Knit 56. And um, it's just great to hear from you and hear who you are. And there are so many knitting podcasts right now, and everyone's vying for your time. And I am really grateful for the time that you choose to spend with me. Um, I'm glad that the things I like to talk about, you like to hear about. So let's get started. I finished my work that I was doing for the Canadian Cal 2016 and I'm calling it a quiet walk it's I've been working on this since mid-July I think and I just love it look oh it's so great so this is knit out of Polworth yarn that I got from Robings Company in California uh, Canada and uh, it's it's nice and silky, and I love it. I love the way it turned out. The pattern is due to be released next week, August 22nd, so stay tuned for that. It's called A Quiet Walk, and I think this would be perfect for a gentleman as well as a lady because it's very subtle, and it was so much fun to knit. It's knit the long way, so you cast on... 400 and some stitches, but it's really, I found it quite fun. There's the part right there in the middle that gives you a break and then a little challenge with the one stitch cables, which I did the one stitch cables without using a cable needle just because I do that. And um, I've been trying to figure out a way to do a short instruction video on how to do one stitch crossovers without using a cable needle. Um, and I've done three of them and I can't seem to find the right yarn with the right lighting that really shows up the work and what I'm doing. So, but I will keep at it and I will be hopefully publishing some, some how to videos about little one stitch cables. Um, and I'll be posting that on my um, my website, Acme Knits. At the beginning and the end of my podcast, you can find where to find me on social media. And I'm in Ravelry, too. So, Okay, so that's one thing. And now I want to knit another one. I'm thinking about using this yarn. It's uh, Madeline Tosh. Tosh Lights Merino. And it has a real, a very different texture. There's no silk in it, obviously. Um, and it's much more of a round yarn. I think it's a one ply, I believe. And um, I would just be interested to see how that works with this pattern and how much it shows up. I like the light color of this too. So one skein of this should do this. Uh, this is 53 inches around by about six and a half inches wide. So that might be next on my needles. I'm not quite sure. Look, it kind of matches the shirt I'm wearing. Huh, funny. So I'm in a new location today, you might have noticed. I'm in my kitchen. This is the door to my basement. There's my unorganized but organized to me spice pantry. Um, my house is 99 years old. I love my house. But as you can see, there's not too many square angles. It's all a little bit wonky, but it's beloved. I love living here. My next thing that I finished that I'm gonna that I showed you last week, I showed you the start, is this little shawlette. And you can't really see, let's see if I can. There's little eyelets. So this is knit out of cotton, 100 percent cotton on a size six needle. And I had, I think last week, I showed you the blocks that I knit out of this. And I'll, hold on, okay. So I knit some 
black squares. They were about 13 by 15 inches and just um, stockinette stitch out of this black cotton. And then I took bleach and a paintbrush and I bleached a design into the black cotton. And the bleach removed the cotton, or removed the dye, but didn't hurt the fiber. And so I undid those and knit this. So I, this is just, this isn't really a pattern anywhere. It's hard to see the, uh, I've posted this on Instagram some pictures that I took in my yard. So this is just, it's garter stitch and I found a generic pattern for that. I'm gonna look and get this right. In a um, pattern book that I bought, it's called Shawl Geometry. And there's a version one and a version two. I have both of them. Shawl Geometry by Holly Chase. And uh, that's in my show notes if you wanna see those either on my blog at Acme Knits or on the Knit 56 podcast group on Ravelry. So it's really great. I think she has a total of maybe 30 basic shawl shapes, and it tells you how to increase. And you can, she's got ver two versions for each one where you can start, like if it's a triangular shawl, for example, she's got directions for starting at the point and working up, or directions for starting here and working down and out. Um, the circular ones the same way from the center to the outside or from the outside to the center and how to figure that out It's very cool. It's very cool. I really like looking through it. So I just wanted to see what this shape would do this It's really hard to see with this speckled yarn but there's six increases every other row so I increase on each edge and then here, here, across the back, here, and here. So um, it's six uneven. Well, it's like six even wedges, except there's no increase in the middle. If you would divide this, this part right here, right in half, that would be the, the three, equal, three on this side, half is the back, three on that side. Anyway, it's really fun. And I really like this. It just covers your shoulders, um, goes around the back. And I think I could see, and it comes down to, but I could see starting a, um, using this to start a cardigan maybe. And actually these points can cross in the front because it goes all the way around. Oh, it's warm, too warm to have that on. So that's that, and I have one more finished item. Ready? I started this a week ago, and I finished it in 12 days, I think. The pattern is up on Ravelry, and it's my flags shawl. I mean, cowl. Flags cowl in honor of the Olympics. Oh, look at that. You can see them there. So it starts with a little 10-stitch repeat. And it goes to 20 stitch repeat and then a 25 stitch repeat. Oh, cool, huh? This also is Madeline Tosh Merino, Tosh Merino Light. Da -da, da -da -da. Knit and purl stitches, very easy, very fast knit. The pattern, is, it's knit on size twos. Um, the pattern is written out and charted. And for my little, the little history part of my podcast, I'm going to talk about the flags pattern, which in honor of the Olympics, all the flags, everybody's showing their country flag. And um, this is an old traditional pattern from Guernsey's, Jersey's, and Aaron's. Fisherman's sweaters from the British Isles. I have, it's in this book by Gladys Thompson. And this book, Knitting from the Netherlands, and I don't know how to say this name, Henriette van der Klift Tulligan. I don't have, it's probably not right at all. But this also is in my show notes if you want to look this book up yourself. So this first book was published, first published in 1959. No, 55. This book is older than me. <laughs> And um, it's great. It's got little stories in it. 
and pictures. It's kind of divided up. Um, let me look at the uh, table of contents. It's divided up by areas, different areas. Uh, Whitby Staves, Northumberland, Sheringham, Guernsey, the Keister, Lincolnshire. Anyway, I don't know how to say these words. Jerseys and Guernseys. Guernseys and Jerseys. So this is the third edition. And there are, are a couple of sweaters, two sweaters in here that use the flag pattern as part of their design. I'm not going to be able to find them. I thought I marked them, but... So before pattern books came out, before you could buy books with hundreds of patterns in them, charted or written out, this is how I would look through and find patterns that I really liked. Okay, here's a version of the flag pattern. It's called the flag, flag pattern. This one, uh, I don't know how, uh, it's, this is worked over number, uh, eight stitches. Mine starts at 10 stitches, but it's from the Scottish, Scottish Fleet pattern 13. And this is from a sweater and a certain area. Um, and then she has stories, little stories that come with the different areas and their different patterns. She's got nice pictures included, graphs. There's different graphs. Um, there's, I'm just going to read a tiny bit of what the author wrote. Um, Gladys Thompson. So this book is the one I'm talking about now. Gladys Thompson. Uh, the patterns seen on fishermen's guernseys have always interested me, and knowing that whilst the fishing families continue, continued to knit them, the patterns would be safe. I also knew they were never written down. So I started years ago to learn and note them for reference. The patterns are traditional and belong to families and places and often have locale names either connected with the sea or with men's occupations. The sweater patterns are written out like that. And so it, and it's kind of hard to follow. The sweater patterns themselves are not charted, but some of the little motifs are charted. So you can see where I would pick out a certain part that I liked and I colored it in. And then I'd go look on the written directions and try to find out, well, where the heck is that part? That's the one I want to, you know, and then I would just chart that one. So the other, th and then this book, I love this book. It's so awesome. There's pictures in here that people sent her and she found in museums too. And it was interesting because they weren't collected or the photos weren't saved for their knitting value, the knitting of the Guernseys. It was um, like in drawers titled shipwrecks and there'd be pictures of men in these beautiful knit sweaters. Um, or what was the other one she said? Shipwrecks or sailing, you know, pictures of sa men on sailboats, fishing boats. Um, so this, where is this right here? It has a lot of the motifs brick broken down and there's my flag pattern right there. Uh, flag motif often appears and is also common on sweaters from Scotland. This motif consists of knit and purl stitches in the Irk. However, flags were called points before the discovery of radio fishermen used flags to communicate. The colors and location of flags told a necessary tale. For example, a boat could report the size of its catch or that a crew member was ill or had died. The ability to send and receive flag signals was in earlier days of the utmost importance. Today in the Netherlands, Flag Day is a special holiday on which all the fishing boats are decked out with their flags. And they could wear a beautiful cowl like this using the flag design. Ah. The other thing I wanted, um, so this book is just so full of really great photos. Um, there's actually some photos of women, of course they're knitting, but most of the pictures are of men wearing, wearing these just fantastic sweaters. And um, 
Look at that. And the, what they have done is taken these sweaters and examined them and then given you a rough estimate of how to knit a sweater like that. So there's a drawing and a chart for one of the sweaters in that photo. Um, it's just, and then there's stories too. There's stories about the photographs, where they came from. You know, there's generic information about gauge and yarn amounts and the yarn type. And um, so it's not like a real how-to book, but it's great. You could knit a sweater from this, a Guernsey or a Gansey. So this too is also separated by fishing villages and their sweaters. It seems that certain areas would tend to have certain designs or certain ways of knitting their sweaters, certain shapes. There was something I wanted to read you about the wool. For the original fisherman's sweaters, ooh, from this book, look at that picture. Okay. For the original fisherman's sweaters, an all wool yarn called Sayet was used, and that's spelled S A J E T. S A J E T. And they say it's pronounced Sayet. Um, Sayet was very popular among the fishing population, but was a household word in the rest of the country as well. Stockings, underwear, sweaters were knitted from it because in addition to being inexpensive, it was readily available. In every country store, one could buy Sayet. In places without stores, it was offered by the traveling peddlers. Opinions as to the quality and durability of Sayet differed. With wear, Sayet acquired a sheen, which was not to everyone's liking. To really appreciate Sayet, it is necessary to look back to the times when all available material had to be used. Farmers' wives brought the fleece of their sheep to the spinning mills to sell for yarn making, but not all the sheep produced wool that is good for yarn. Through the centuries, advances in breeding techniques have produced sheep raised specifically for meat or milk or wool. The wool of a sheep, bred for that purpose, like the merino, is long and, so and soft. Excuse me. Yarn spun, yarn spun from it is strong and always stays soft because it need not be tightly spun. The wool of a sheep bred for meat, such as the Dutch Texelar from the island of Texel, is short and fairly rough. To spin good yarn from it, it must be tightly twisted. The technical term in Dutch for the firm twist is sayet. Because this wool was grown domestically and was available in large quantities, the price was low. As long as people had to be thrifty, sayet was popular. After World War II, the standard of living improved and people were able to afford more expensive yarns. The sayet disappeared. The introduction of cheaper synthetic yarns played a role in Sayet's fall from popularity. When Sayet disappeared, so did the typical Sayet colors, Nassau blue and Nassau beige. Nassau is the name of the Dutch royal family. I hope I'm saying that right, N-A-S-S-A-U. Um, in addition to those colors, Sayet was dyed black, dark blue, and gray. The, Sayet, the Nassau blue was a blue yarn into which small red threads were spun, giving the blue yarn a reddish hue. Not everyone cared for, uh, for this color, and in certain parts of the country, Nassau blue was a color worn, worn only by poor people. In other places, Nassau blue was used only for stockings. For sweaters, one knitted with the good Sayet in black or blue. On the islands of Zuidholland, okay, Z-U-I-D-H-O-L-L-A-N-D. Nassau blue was an esteemed color and was preferred for sweater knitting. After the war, when Sayet disappeared, fishermen's wives knitted the sweaters from stocking wool. Today, synthetic yarns are also used for fishermen's sweaters. So that's sad. I wonder, I would love to um, feel some of this Sayet wool and see what it was like. So yeah, this is a great book. I love this book. The so last time I told you about some socks and a sock pattern that I found in an old magazine um, a piecework magazine where the socks are knit one inside the other two at a time two at a time 
and I made it through the cuffs. You do the cuffs separately. Here's how far I am. So I'm doing this beautiful maroon. It's much redder in the camera there. And then the body of the socks will be brown. Toes, heels, and cuffs will be this red. And it's they're knit in the round. And um, if I pull them out, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> so you can see both. So when you're knitting it, the insides are worked together. I'm doing this on a magic loop size two. I thought I would be okay because when I knit um, with my yarn in my left hand and pick it, I usually have a looser tension than if I'm throwing because my usual way of knitting is throwing. I can do both, um, but my preferred method is to throw. And so it's just a little tidier and neater because it's what I do all the time. But when I purl throwing, it's looser. And when I use my left hand to hold the yarn, it's also looser. So that's how these are worked. This side, which is the side away from me, is knit, holding the yarn in my left hand. And this side, the side closest to me, is purled, holding that yarn in my right hand. And I'm getting two different gauges. Um, that's kind of a bummer. So I'm going to think about tightening up my purl and loosening up my... Let's see if I can show you the right sides. It's kind of fun to manipulate these in and out. Um, so, yeah, you can see it's definitely two different gauges. This side right here is the knit, the side I'm knitting on the, on the side that's away from me and holding the yarn in my left hand. And this is the purled part where I'm purling the stitches that are closer to me. So they're on the needles every other stitch. There's a, they're alternated on the needles. Uh, now I'm probably got my yarn all twisted up inside and outside, but I'm going to carry on. I mean, it's a pair of socks and we'll see how it goes. I'm interested to get to the heel and see how they do that. Cause it looks like they keep, the stitches on the needles and work with both the heel. It's a traditional heel with a gusset and a turn. Um, so we'll see how that works out. Anyway, those are my socks. Those are in progress. Still growing. My still growing projects I have not worked on my Shackleton Cal white winter jacket. I keep promising myself I'm going to dedicate a day to it on a weekend. So far it hasn't happened. This, and this weekend I'm going away to a music weekend with a bunch of friends and it's called Square Dance Weekend held at a state park and we rent a group camp and there's about 130 of us and we play music and square dance, Cajun dance and do all kinds of fun things. It's been going on for about 30 years. I've been going since 1990. So this will be my 16th or 17th one. Um, which of course means I want a new project. Which of course means I won't work on my white winter jacket. So I'm either gonna take, I'm either gonna take a quiet walk in the Mal, in the Madeline Tosh, or this is my Glory in the Meeting House shawl. This is about ready to be published too. The knitter, the the uh, test knitters are just about done with it, and this is in two colors. Uh, this is uh, Malabrigo Lace Weights, and it's a really nice lace, and the sizes of the lace repeat vary and are separated by some rows of garter stitch, and it works up really fun. It's not exactly triangular. Um, the increase edge, you only increase on one edge, and that becomes the top of the shawl. So I have... Some really fun yarn that I got ages ago. Really. Oh, there's the mailing label. When did I get this? It came from Australia. I don't see a date. Darn it. Anyway, it's this 100% Australian merino in a lace weight. 
And I've started a couple projects with it. And I've never been happy with what I've started. But I think I'm thinking of doing my Glory in the Meeting House shawl with this. All one color. So what will be varied is just the areas of lace that that get shorter as the lace as the shawl gets longer. It's really pretty. It's really soft. And I have, hmm, I think I have four ounces of this, about 100 grams. So I don't know what to start. This one would be really easy. Knit. Neither one would be easy for me to knit in the car. It's about a two and a half hour drive. I could do it in the car. I could do it, you know, while chatting with friends. Either one of those. I can't decide. I have to decide tonight because we're leaving tomorrow and I want to cast on before we leave. Oh, such a dilemma. Such a wonderful dilemma. The other thing I've been working on, which I won't take, is, oh, this shawl. By, it's, oh, look at those colors. They maybe are a little more vibrant in the camera than in real life, but the color itself is true. Maybe the hue is a little shadier. But, um... This is working up and it's so fun. This is the first pattern, it's called Miss Grace. This is the first pattern that I've actually only referred to the pattern. Oh, that's where I changed yarns in the middle of a row. Don't look at that. Um, that I've only used the pattern on my iPad, which uh, I, I almost always work from paper patterns. I always have until this one thing because it's kind of a lot and I didn't want to print out the whole thing um, and I I think I like working for my iPad as opposed to a piece of paper but I'm not 100% sold on it um, the uh, what was I gonna say about that the problem is is that I'm watching knitting YouTube podcasts knitting podcasts on YouTube, then I have to stop them and go look at my pattern and I write down a few rows, so I'm using paper anyway, because I pretty much have to look every row, I have to look and make sure what I'm doing and what color and do I put these little waves of color in, where do I do that and how many stitches. Um, so that's an interesting process, working from the iPad. And I was just going to talk about, uh, about one of the podcasts that I really enjoy that I watched today, this morning, and it's called Stitched in Sweden, and the host is Maria, and she is a lovely young woman. Her knitting is so beautiful, and she talks about sewing and knitting and bread making, and now she's making jam, um, and they're usually very succinct. They're short and very succinct well planned out podcasts so if you're looking for a new podcast um, check out Maria in, in Stitched in Sweden and I think that's everything I have to say today <laughs> um, thanks for joining me really thanks again for joining me and sticking through this podcast and feel free to give me a thumbs up uh, leave a comment Subscribe to my podcast. Come to Ravelry and join the Knit 56 podcast Ravelry group. Introduce yourselves. Um, there's also a thread in there if you want to ask me any questions. Um, and I'll try to answer them, be they about knitting or myself in general. Um, anyway, thanks for coming along today. Thanks for taking this ride with me to the Netherlands. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.